Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session of Plants, Pests, and Pathogens. Um, just a couple reminders. You've been looking at the box already for a while, or the first slide for a while. But just one more reminder um, that we can see everything in the chat box. So um, not a time to talk about your kids and dogs. Um, leave your microphone button turned off except when you're speaking. And the agent will be, the session will be recorded. All right. So you can tell that I am not Lucy Bradley. This is Barbara Shu. Um, I'll be uh, moderating today while Lucy is off. Um, I'll let you in on the secret. It's Lucy's birthday. All right. Um, I think there's, um, with no further ado, we'll move on and turn it over to Lee Jay, to, um, uh, who gives us our excellent um, technical assistance to uh, walk through some of the um, technical side of the program. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lee Jay, and I just wanted to give you a, an overview of the Blackboard Collaborate session that you're in, in case this is your first time joining us. On the left side of the screen, um, you'll notice that there is a talk button. Um, only you press that if uh, you've raised your hand first and you can ask us a question. Make sure that if you're not talking, you have that um, unselected. If you need to, to type something, um, ask a question, you can type it in the chat window. And um, what I'm going to ask you to do now is let us know where you are. Um, on the left part of the presentation, there is a sunburst, and I'm pointing to it right now. And if you'll just click on that and then click on your screen, um, let us know where in North Carolina you are. All right. Thanks, everyone. If you have any questions, just type them in the chat box, and I can help you. Um, and if you have any questions about the content, also type them in the chat box, and Barbara and I will make sure that they're addressed by our presenters. All right. Thanks, Lee Jay. So um, as you know, this is in-service training in plants, pests, and pathogens. Um, we have uh, a busy day today, and I think I'll just go ahead and uh, show you what our program looks like. So we're going to have our regional updates from the Coastal Plain and Piedmont today, showstopper plants. Then um, we have sort of two different features today. One is current issues with turf with uh, Lee Butler. Then current issues with diseases. Then our second feature, um, something that Mike Munster and Matt Bertone have come up with called Critter or Not. And then wrapping up with current issues with insects from Matt Bertone. So starting off are our regional updates. First from the Coastal Plain, Charlotte Glen, and Pender County. All right, thank you. That is a really old picture. <laughs> Here's a newer picture. My hair is longer. Um, here in the coastal plain where I'm located this summer, we've had a lot of rain, like most places in North Carolina, which has been good because we have a lot of sandy soils, so plants have grown really well. And we haven't seen a lot of issues other than in some of our clay soil areas, a little bit of root rot. So I decided for the Coastal Plain update, I would tell you about a workshop that we just held here in Pender County that was extremely popular and very successful. Um, I usually do a fall gardening workshop because that's a very popular topic. We have lots of people interested in fall vegetable gardening, especially since a lot of people had good success this summer. But this year I wanted to do something different. I wanted to have some hands-on involvement. And I really wanted to get master gardeners involved. Um, I have a lot of master gardeners who are great gardeners, and they love to show people how to do stuff, but they don't necessarily want to stand up in front of a group of people. So I thought, how can I get them involved? And so the idea was to hold this workshop in which I would give the opening presentation and talk a little bit about seed starting basics and the type of crops you can grow in the fall. 
then master gardeners would lead small groups and hands-on activities of how to sow seed and how to transplant seedlings. So we set the room up in blocks of tables. We had one master gardener for every five participants, and that was to, to lead the hands-on part. And the two hands-on activities we had were sowing seed, and we let the participants sow um, parsley seed, which we soaked overnight for them, and we let them sow some cabbage seed, early Jersey Wakefield. Um, on the, the table starting off, we had the pots for them to use. We had um, the seed starting mix. We used Metro Mix 360. I just personally like that. And we let them use popsicle sticks for labels because they are much, much, much cheaper than the plastic labels you can buy. Our second hands-on activity was transplanting seedlings. Everybody loved this. Um, you know, some people, it was funny to watch them. They were so hesitant to touch those seedlings to start with. But once they did one, they just you know, want to do packs and packs and packs. So I had started seedlings at my house, um, red Russian kale and Italian sprouting broccoli. The great thing about doing this in the fall is you don't need a greenhouse because you don't need any additional heat. Um, I started two weeks before, but those seedlings were a little bit on the large side. Um, I would recommend for a fall like this to start 10 days, start those seedlings 10 days before the workshop. So this is just some pictures of people, you know, they just, the seed sowing itself was fun, but they loved transplanting the seedlings. And one of the challenges with this workshop was knowing how many seeds to start ahead of time, so we had people pre-register. Um, I made a quick online pre-registration using the Cal Survey Builder, or people could call in, but 90% of people registered online. And I asked them to enter their email address. And that let me send them a reminder email saying, hey, you're registered for a workshop. Um, and it also gives me their email, so if I want to do some follow-up evaluation and uh, send out some follow-up tips to them, which I've already done, um, I've got their email addresses. And then, of course, we had them sign in on the day of the actual workshop. We did offer this for free. Our Master Gardener Association paid for the materials. And the good thing about um, having them as our sponsor is it provided us a graceful way of promoting some of our upcoming fundraisers. So what I did was this, one of the very first slides I showed was to thank our sponsors and to say that the association was able to sponsor and pay for these materials through fundraisers, um, such as an upcoming fall plant sale we have, we're doing a fall ball border, and we had some items for sale that day. We had a garden planner and our cookbook. So just to let people know how the, the project was funded and to encourage them to support future programs. This is just a list of the materials. Um, it ended up costing about $50 to prepare for 85 participants. We didn't quite have 85 participants, but that's how many registered. Um, we ended up only having to buy the seed starting mix and the seeds, and the cost was mostly in the seed starting mix. Um, all the other materials we had on hand, we had the four inch pots and the four packs. We had bought a, a whole case of those several years ago. Um, the popsicle sticks we already had. Um, but those items aren't that expensive, and of course, you can have people um, bring four packs and, and wash them and recycle them and use them that way, and that could save a little bit of money. We had a total of 68 people participate. We did hold the workshop twice, once during the week and once on the weekend. We had um, participation was almost the same, weekday versus Saturday. And I had 27 different master gardeners involved between the two different workshops. Most of those were helping hands-on. Some of them were helping with registration, others with selling calendars and items. Um, we did sell 38 of our garden planners and 16 of our cookbooks, and that was over $500 that our Master Gardener Association raised. And of the evaluations we handed out, we had 56 completed and handed in. Um, everybody, and this is the first time I've ever had everybody filled out evaluation said they were 100% highly satisfied with the relevance, the quality, and overall satisfaction. Usually there's a couple of people that say they're just satisfied, but everybody was highly satisfied, so it was very well received. Questions I asked on the evaluation were, um, do you think this workshop's given you the knowledge and skills to more successfully grow vegetables? 93% were definite yes. Um, highest uh, rating of the other, you know, most people were definitely sure they were going to save some money as a result of the workshop by growing vegetables from seed. 
they were going to be able to grow varieties they hadn't grown before. They could, would be able to grow more of their own food. And then that last question about growing vegetables for the first time, I was trying to get a feel for how many people you know, were first time gardeners. I, I put it in the same block of questions with these others, but it probably would have been better to put as its own question because I think it confused people. Um, but it looked like most of the people said they were already doing this. They were already growing vegetables. So we didn't have a lot of first time gardeners in the workshop. Then, of course, there's other things to look at, potential impacts. Um, I really like the information, the link that Lucy sent out earlier this year from Oregon State University, where one of their specialists had looked at different figures from um, vegetable gardens. And they came up with an average return of 74 cents per square foot um, as an a economic benefit for vegetable gardening. Um, so in a success story, I'll probably use that. And I usually kind of to estimate a small garden, um, saying somebody has four 48 square foot raised beds. Um, and you know, so they're looking at like a, a um, small vegetable garden, a little bit less than 200 square feet. Using that figure gives $142 value. Um, and then if I times that by the 68 people that were in the workshop, you know, you're looking at just under $10,000 of, of economic value. And that, I feel like that's a little bit conservative. There, of course, there's additional benefits from gardening, um, physical and mental, from eating more vegetables and exercise. And if I want to do further, further follow-up email to see how people, what people were able to do as a result, I do have their email address so I can get in touch with them. And other things I'm you know, really hoping to see as benefits are that my master gardeners have gained confidence and would be willing to lead similar programs. Um, also, since this was a really well-received, very positive experience for participants, that could lead to advocacy for extension. And I've posted all the materials from this workshop online um, on the NCSU Garden website under the Extension Professionals link. If you go to the advanced training, I created a related page that says Charlotte Glenn Seed Workshop. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at them and download the materials. There's the PowerPoint, um, the evaluation, I put the press release and other publicity materials. And really encourage you to do something like this in your county because it was, I, I just can't tell you how many compliments we received. We had people from several counties and many of them said, Oh, I really wish they'd do something like this in my county. So it was it was well received and um and, and just a really good workshop and a good way to involve master gardeners. Any questions? I think we're gonna have to move on to our next presentation. Thanks. That was a really excellent program. All right. So our next uh, update is from the Piedmont. Uh, we'll hear from Gina Myers. And take it away, Gina. OK, can you hear me clearly? Um, all right, unless I hear otherwise, I'll just keep going. Um, here in the Piedmont, we did not fare quite as well as in Charlotte's area. Um, there were a number of problems this summer with all the rain. Uh, farmers struggled to get their crops um, you know, to grow because there wasn't enough sunshine and too much rain, disease pressure, insect pressure. So um, they're hoping for a better fall and, and have replanted and are getting ready for that. Um, what I did for my Piedmont update was take note of some um, insect pressure in my garden this, this summer. And uh, I will say it's probably been worse in my garden than I ever remember. So uh, one thing I want to say is I am uh, completely humbled in uh, diving into the insect world. I have no training in this. If anyone wants to make a comment and contribute and correct me, please do. Because I was up till midnight last night trying to find some of these insects and positively identify them. Um, it's tricky. So anyway, I will start with um, one insect that I got to know a little bit better this weekend was the spittle bug, or the, the, the groups. There are a number of different kinds of spittle bugs. But on my muscadine grapes, I noticed a very viscous 
liquid and so I just started exploring a little bit and it is really viscous like mucus. If you haven't ever uh, pulled it off the plant, you should give it a try. Um, and then in amongst the, the viscous spittle are these little insects that you can barely see. And so I um, kind of extricated them. I took a few more pictures with them away from the spittle. And actually, they're quite good. Uh, this, these are the nymph stages. Um, they're quite uh, fast walkers. It was hard to get a, a good photo, really. Um, but you can see uh, the one on the left, the top left, has a little tube coming out the back. That is its rear end. And then the one that's sitting on top of the spittle, uh, you kind of get a front view of the, the rear end. And what's interesting about this group of spittle bugs um, and is that they suck the sap and it filters kind of through their body, through these tubules, and they turn it into this very viscous liquid. And then that little tube uh, and at the rear uh, actually makes the bubbles form. And so what this does is create a protection for them. And it really does. I mean, you don't see them normally. It protects them from predators and it also uh, keeps them moist. So I'm not sure exactly what um, the name of this insect is, but it, um, it is feeding on our muscadine grapes. Uh, it's not the grass feeding spittle bug. Um, typically, they don't cause a lot of damage, but um, they can transmit viruses, uh, from my understanding. Um, next is another one I had trouble identifying, and I, I think my last word is it probably does not belong to the Crambidae family, but probably the Tortricidae family, if I'm saying that correct. Uh, these are fruit tree leaf rollers, and I have leaf tear up there, but um, what I've learned is those typically um, go to the tips of plants and and these leaf rollers were actually more, uh, they folded over the leaf. And what I observed is uh, complete decimation on our 10 foot tall elderberry shrubs, which was surprising. Never had this problem before. And the entire huge shrub was, was practically defoliated. Um, it's also attacked our mulberry. So you, this is a mulberry leaf, and you can see what it did there. Um, this is just to give you a size of it. And then on the lower left, you see how they actually roll the leaf over. If you pull it back, that silk kind of comes apart. And you can see the um, caterpillar prior to its molting. Um, so in general, they say they don't do a lot of damage. Um, you can treat them with Bt. Um, they overwinter as eggs sometimes uh, on the um, stems but can, some leaf rollers can overwinter as larvae. Uh, but I'll be watching for these next year and try and catch them before they do that to my elderberry. I was out on Dorothea Dix, which is in our backyard, uh, practically the Dorothea Dix campus that they're talking about turning into a park. And I saw these. I'm getting a lot of calls from homeowners about um, oak caterpillars, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of damage and creating a lot of waste. Uh, I don't think that this is the one that's necessarily doing this, but I thought it was really beautiful uh, couple caterpillars here. And typically, they, uh, they don't do so much damage um, unless they're just in high volume. So it's more of an urban tree problem than it is out in the woods, is my understanding. This, of course, uh, I took in my garden this weekend as well. These are the black swallowtail larvae. And um, they're just so beautiful. I had to include those. You can almost see the little hairs on the big caterpillar's feet. I think they're extraordinary. And finally, this is an example of, um, I was at the Plantsman Tour at the Arboretum. And this is one of the plants that they're looking at for heart, winter hardiness. It's um, begonia from Bolivia. And it was just so beautiful. We all oohed and awed over it and um, hope it shows to be um, hardy here because it really was a, an, just a, an extreme beauty. 
and here's a close-up of the flower. And that's it. Okay, great. Thanks so much. All right. Um, just a reminder that if you have questions for our speakers that you can type them in the chat box and they can answer as the rest of the presentation is going on. Showstopper plants. Is Mark there? Hi. Oh, sure enough. Thanks so much. Hey, so when referring to a big scoop of wasabi that he just regrettably consumed on the animated movie Cars 2, Mater says, do not try the free pistachio ice cream. It done turned. Well, the 2013 Showstopper Plants tree selection is even hotter than wasabi, especially in fall with, with Chinese pistachios, spectacular color. Hey, tough as nails, drought tolerant, pest free, and lustrous green foliage make for a wonderful medium sized tree. You just can't go wrong with this great specimen. Hey, thanks for looking for this and other plants at your local nursery because this Showstopper program is a partnership between Cooperative Extension and the NC Nursery and Landscape Association to highlight proven plants for just about any Carolina landscape. Hey, so that's our showstopper plant for today, Chinese pistache. Even if you can't grow a mustache, grow a pistache. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Very entertaining and a great looking plant. Okay, now uh, we're going to move on to our first feature. This is current issues in turf. I think everybody has a little bit of turf in their yard. Even if you uh, are more uh, flower inclined, that turf really helps set it off. So we're going to be hearing from Lee Butler today. He um, is a diagnostician for turf grass diseases in the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. Um, and he uh, does a variety of other things in the turf program, including conducting uh, fungicide research, um, running the lab, and he also co-teaches Turf Weed and Disease Management Agriculture Institute. Uh, Lee got his BS in uh, turf grass management at NC State, his MS in plant pathology at NC State, and I know he just loves the wolf pack. So I'm going to turn it over to Lee. All right, thanks, Barbara. Uh, I do indeed love the wolf pack. Um, I'm logged in currently as Mike Munster, and obviously I'm not Mike, uh, even though he's sitting directly behind me. Uh, but today we're going to talk about. Um, wait a minute. I'm not going to focus on any particular disease just yet in, uh, in turf or home lawns, uh, but there are some, uh, uh, an area that I would like to talk about, and uh, that's the use of fungicides. Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to talk about some key concepts uh, when it comes to turf diseases, and these are very important uh, to understand uh, even for, for the most advanced person or, or the beginner uh, when it comes to turf grass diseases. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at the slide, uh, we have uh, the growth habits of warm season and cool season turf grasses. Uh, so warm season grasses would be like Bermuda grass, Zoysia grass, St. Augustine, centipede, uh, cool season grasses, uh, tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, ryegrass, et cetera. Um, so when we see the most severe diseases of these grasses, it's when they're at their slowest growing or they're, they're, when their root and shoot growth is at a minimum. Uh, so for our warm season grasses, our most severe diseases are going to be in the spring and fall, um, as you see here, when the root and shoot growth is at a minimum. And then for the cool season grasses, it's going to be in the summer months. So for most of you that grow tall fescue, um, you know that as, as with brown patch being the most severe disease of tall fescue, it's always in the summer months. Uh, and that's important to know. <clears throat> a, good a good example of that uh, is a picture here. This is in front of Kilgore Hall. Uh, I don't think it's planted like this anymore, but it used to be there were strips uh, of tall fescue, I have highlighted here with a laser pointer, planted uh, in between the zoysia grass. So you have a cool season grass, the tall fescue, and a warm season grass, zoysia grass. Uh, this photo was taken in the summer time of the year, uh, and you can see the, the cool season grass, the tall fescue, is stressed uh, and being easily attacked by a very common disease known as brown patch, uh, caused by the fungus Rhizoctonia solani. And you can see it stops right on the line where it meets up with the zoysia grass. The zoysia grass is very happy in the summertime, not stressed at all, uh, so that fungus isn't attacking the zoysia grass. 
we go into the fall of the year, this is out at Lake Wheeler Turf Field Lab, um, you see a huge semicircular patch here. Uh, that's a disease known as large patch. Uh, and that's also caused by that same fungus, Rhizoctonia solana. But you'll see here we have tall fescue planted in the borders. Uh, and you can see that large patch stops right on that line. So in the fall of the year, tall fescue is fat and happy. It's loving life. The zoysia grass is struggling. Um, reduced photo period. Soil temperatures are getting cooler. So it's weak and more susceptible to disease. So keep that in mind when you're managing warm and cool season turfs uh, when you're most likely to see the most severe diseases. Now I'd like to switch gears and just talk about fungicides because I get a lot of questions from uh, homeowners, landscapers, uh, county agents um, about fungicides and fungicide use uh, in turf grasses, home lawns in particular. Uh, if you see the picture here, these chaps here, are, this is an old picture from a golf course. They're spreading. Uh, are one of our first fungicides known as the Bordeaux mixture. Bordeaux mixture. Uh, you can see there they're smiling, having a good time. They have no personal protection equipment on. Uh, who knows how safe that is. But you can see in the other picture here, we've come a long ways, obviously, in our technology, the way we apply fungicides, the safety of them, uh, being more diligent about wearing personal protection equipment, et cetera. So what is a fungicide? Um, most people assume that a fungicide because it literally literally does mean it's a fungus killing substance. Uh, they expect, just like when they spray Roundup, for instance, on a weed, that they're going to kill that disease and it'll never come back. Uh, that's kind of misleading because today's fungicides do not actually kill fung fungi. They actually just inhibit the growth. So if you want to think of it as, as putting the disease on pause, uh, so you, you know, if you're treating something like brown patch and tall fescue and you go out and spray a fungicide, you know, that disease will come back in three to four weeks as that fungicide wears off. And this can be a very frustrating concept, uh, in particular for homeowners, because uh, like I said, they expect it to kill it and it to go away and never come back. As far as the safety of our turf fungicides, uh, relative to other pesticides, they're pretty safe. Uh, and here are some, here's some pesticides to compare it to, particularly insecticides, uh, with insecticides acting on our nervous system, just like they do uh, on insects' nervous systems. Uh, if you look at the oral LD50 uh, milligram per kilogram of body weight, you can see something like aldicarb. And it would only take one milligram per kilogram uh, to kill 50% of us. Whereas you look at some fungicides down here at the bottom, you can see they would take much, much, much more. Uh, and you can see how that compares to things like nicotine, caffeine, aspirin. Um, you know, the, 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 the <clears throat> I'm not suggesting you go out and drink fungicides or smoke them. <laughs> But just know that overall, they're relatively safe when compared to other fungicides. I get that question a lot. You know, if I apply this fungicide to my lawn, is it going to harm my pets? Will it harm my children? Uh, and the, the, the general answer to that is no, uh, if you follow the label uh, and allow them to dry on the leaf blade before re-entry. Before re so they're relatively safe. Um, one of the interesting things to note about some of our better fungicides in home lawns, uh, they come from the, the QOI chemical family or the strobulurns, they're actually derivatives of, of a mushroom. So some of our better fungicides that we actually use now in home loans are, are actually developed from a, from a, from a fungus. Uh, the mushroom strobulurus tenocellus, uh, that's why they're called the strobulurns, if you've heard them call that, that class of fungicides. Uh, that would be products like Heritage, Insignia, Disarm, or Compass. I'm sure most of you have heard those products uh, for, for lawn care, particularly if you're controlling brown patch or large patch. And cool in some in warm season grasses. Uh, another thing I like to point out is uh, fungicide the frac the frac codes on fungicide labels. If you're not familiar with these, I have it circled in the red there. Uh, when you look at fungicide labels, they now have these numbers up top. And the reason I like to point this out, particularly uh, for beginners uh, or amateur gardeners, is this is important to know when you're selecting fungicides. Um, it's, it's related to the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, so it, it's to help manage fungicide resistance. Uh, and we won't get into that today. Uh, but when you see a fungicide label, let's say with a number three at the top, and you're looking at another product on the shelf, and it has that same number three uh, at the top, uh, they may actually have different active ingredients. Uh, but having that number three up top tells you that essentially they're, they or they are within the same chemical family. So you don't want to spray. Um, you know, you don't want to tank mix two number threes together or two number 11s together or so forth. Even though they may be completely different trade names, have completely different active ingredients in them, 
they're, they are in the same chemical family, so you're essentially spraying the same thing together. Uh, so it's just a quick way to look at the top of those labels and say, hey, these things are essentially the same or they are different without having to memorize, learn all the chemistry. Uh, now we're going to talk about topical modes of action. So this is how fungicides behave once they're in the plant. And you'll see why this is a very, very important concept to know uh, for those of you that apply fungicides, not only on turf, but other plants as well. Um, we have what are called the contact fungicides. So these are fungicides, when you apply them to the plant, they stay on the leaf surface. So this is kind of like applying a coat of paint. They are not absorbed into the plant, and they are not moved around in the plant. And we have what are known as localized penetrants. So these are fungicides that are absorbed into the leaf cuticle. Uh, the way I like to relay this is it's like um, taking a paper towel and laying it on a wet spot on the counter. You know, it just kind of soaks in and moves a little bit to the left and right. And it doesn't move far. And then we have what are known as systemic fungicides. Uh, these are fungicides that are absorbed into the plant and then translocated. Uh, and within those systemic fungicides, we have different types. We have majority of them are acropodal penetrants, which means they move upward only. And then you have the true systemic fungicides that actually move up and down in the plant. Uh, in turf fungicides, there's only one group of fungicides that do that. That's the phosphites. Uh, so things like Aliette Signature, Allude, Magellan, Appear. Uh, that group of fungicides, they're the only ones that are true systemics. And the reason this is important to know, um, if you're treating for a root disease and you apply it to the foliage in a low volume of water and you don't water it in, it's never going to reach the target in the root system. So if you're applying a, you know, a cropital penetrant, it's only going to hit that leaf surface and it's going to move up to the leaf tips. It'll never make it to the root system. So you need to pay attention to how, what the topical modes of actions are uh, for these fungicide products and depending on which disease you're targeting. And th this will make more sense here in a minute when I show you a handy tool uh, that will help you with all this. This is also important because it determines your length of residual control. So contact fungicides tend to last about 7 to 10 days, localized penetrants about 10 to 14, and then systemic fungicides can last 14 to 28 days. When targeting diseases, um, if you're, if you're treating for a foliar disease, uh, say something like brown patch or pythium blight, something that's attacking in just the foliage, you can get away with applying that fungicide in one to two gallons of water per thousand square feet uh, and you'll be just fine. If you're targeting a crown disease, something like anthracnose basal rot, you want to bump that gallon, the carrier volume up a little bit to two, three gallons of water per thousand square feet, uh, or you can lightly water it in if you have an irrigation system. And then if you're targeting a root disease, uh, something like spring dead spot for those of you that manage warm season grasses. You're going to have to put that out in five gallons of water per thousand square feet or water it in with an eight to a quarter inch of irrigation, uh, which is what most people will do because five gallons of water per thousand, you're going to be mixing the sprayer a whole lot. Uh, so in, the, in those cases, it's nice to have a good irrigation system in place that you can water that fungicide down into the root zone and move it to the target. Uh, so keep that, keep that in mind uh, when you're managing turf diseases. Uh, there are a tremendous amount of fungicides available out there. You know, how do you go about selecting the right one for each application? Um, there are many ways you can look in the Ag Chem, man Ag Chem Manual. Uh, you can look online. There are a lot of resources online. But I would like to point you to one on uh, our website, uh, Turf Files. Uh, hopefully most of you have been there by now. There's a tremendous amount of information on Turf Files about managing uh, turf, uh, insects, weeds, and diseases. Uh, but for fun there's a tool on there that will help you select your fungicides. Uh, if you go to the disease tab, which is up top, uh, and then there's a, a, a tab at the bottom right that says disease age, uh, and then there will be a link that says disease management. So it's pretty easy to find. You click on that, and it will take you to a page where you can choose your turf type. So you have athletic fields, commercial turf, golf courses, and residential lawns. Uh, in this example, I chose uh, commercial turf to be a lot like a residential lawn. Um, and then it gives you the grasses that are grown primarily here in North Carolina. You can see those listed. Uh, in this example, I chose tall fescue. And then it'll bring up a list of diseases that are commonly observed on tall fescue here in North Carolina uh, or, or that have been diagnosed over the years. Uh, so you choose the disease. Uh, you can select up to five different diseases, the ones you're worried about. So for this example, I just chose brown patch. And then it'll bring up fungicides that are labeled for brown patch. Uh, it'll, tell you, it'll tell you the, uh, the active ingredient. 
It'll tell you the chemical class it's in, and then it'll tell you the trade name. And the trade name is the product you're going to be looking for when you're shopping for it. And then also it'll have a chart over here that's almost like a stoplight. It'll be green, yellow, and red. Uh, the products that are in green are products that work really well when disease pressure is heavy. Products in yellow work really well when disease pressure is moderate, and so on and so forth. And it explains it all in great detail uh, if you go look at it. And then you can select the fungicides you're interested in or the ones you're shopping for or trying to find. Uh, and it'll take you to that page. You can choose up to five. Uh, and it'll tab them out for you up top. It's pretty nice. Uh, once again, so the one that this highlighted is flutolanil. Uh, that's sold as ProStar. Uh, what's nice about this is it'll tell you what the rate is. So you'll see the rate is one and a half to three ounces per thousand square feet. It says to apply it every 14 to 21 days. It tells you that it's necropodal penetrant. Uh, and now that you're all experts on fungicides, you know that that means that it moves upward only. Uh, and then it tells you specific instructions to apply to the foliage in two to five gallons of water per thousand square feet using appropriate nozzles and pressure to produce medium to coarse sized droplets. And it gives you a whole other wealth of information below about the details. Um, but it's a very, very, very handy tool. I use it myself all the time when I'm trying to develop fungicide programs for folks. Uh, if you've never used it, I highly recommend you play around with it. Um, so check that out on turf files. Uh, when you're selecting the fungicide rate, you'll see there, just like that, it said one and a half to three ounces. Uh, what that is basically telling you is you have a preventative rate and a curative rate or a low and a high rate. Preventative applications are before the fungal infection occurs. Um, you know, an ounce, of provision, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as they say. Uh, you're going to use low rates on short intervals or high rates on long intervals when you're doing preventative applications. All topical modes of action are effective. Uh, when you get into a curative, situa a curative situation, this is after the fungal infection has occurred, and you're going to use high rates at short intervals. Uh, acropital penetrants are the best, and it's best to take mix of contact fungicide with that if possible uh, to help clear that up. Uh, and while we're talking about fungicides, just briefly I want to mention that one of the other common questions I get uh, is where do you find these fungicides? Because if you go to big box stores, you're only going to see maybe one active ingredient, and that tends to be mycobutanil, uh, often uh, sold as immunox or other forms. Uh, and people you know, often want to find products like Heritage or Insignia or Disarm, and they can't find that at big box stores. Uh, so you have to go to specialty stores like John Deere Landscapes, Southern States, Southern Seeds, etc. Uh, there are several of them out there. Sometimes specialty garden centers will carry these fungicides. Uh, and also, you actually be surprised at how many of these products you can find on the internet, like at Amazon. Uh, and they're all available. You don't have to have a special permit to use them or anything, uh, for the most part. Um, pretty easy to get. Now, the, the thing that will may shock you will be the sticker price, because they're usually typically packaged for commercial use. Uh, so sometimes I encourage people to go in together, maybe with friends. Uh, to buy a case or a jug uh, because that you know it may last you a really long time depending on which product you get. But it actually ends up being much cheaper on a per day uh, basis uh, with those products because they last so long. It's particularly those products like Heritage Insignia, Disarm, uh, you know they last 28 to 35 days, uh, particularly for those of you controlling brown patch and tall fescue. All right. I uh, would like to focus on one disease briefly here, just to, just to point it out, because uh, this, is, this is a current issue uh, and it's something that's often overlooked. Uh, and that's dollar spot. Um, not many people are familiar with dollar spot on Kentucky bluegrass. Um, and the reason I point it out is it often gets confused for brown patch and tall fescue. Um, and the problem there is, is that people will see this dollar spot in their home lawns, cool season grasses. They'll think it's brown patch, and they'll spray brown patch fungicides and, and achieve zero control, uh, become very frustrated. Uh, the problem is they misdiagnosed the disease and likely didn't realize that their lawn had as much Kentucky bluegrass in it as it did. And I'll explain why, how that happens here in a minute. Uh, when you look at them up close, they're very easy to confuse one for the other. Uh, you can see this is a lesion, typical lesion caused by a dollar spot on a Kentucky bluegrass plant. Uh, then you see here the lesions on tall fescue uh, from brown patch look very similar, uh, although they do have subtle differences, but to the average person they're going to look exactly the same. The key thing that I recommend you do is learn how to identify the different grasses. Uh, so you need to know the difference between tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass. 
Uh, there are guides online that will show you how to tell the difference between those. Uh, you can see looking at the picture here, Top SU has much deeper ridges uh, on, in the, in, on the foliage there compared to Kentucky bluegrass. It also has a much sharper tip, like a, a, a saber type tip, uh, whereas Kentucky bluegrass has that, that canoe or boat shaped tip up front. Uh, and tends to be a little shinier on the backside and has a midrib. Uh, these are all things you can find if you look on, at guides. But the reason this is important is a lot of cool season uh, seed comes in a mixture. Uh, so, you know, often you'll see tall fescue mixtures with three or four different tall fescues in them. But also you'll see them with Kentucky bluegrass in them. Um, when you look at that, uh, you'll see those labels. We'll talk about, you know, it's a 90-10 mix or an 80-20 mix or whatever. Uh, and that's very misleading because those mixes are based on a per weight basis. So if you look at a gram of tall fescue seed, there's about 500 seeds in that. In a gram of Kentucky bluegrass, there's about 4,800 seeds. And that's important to know when you're looking at these labels because you'll see on a seed label it may say the mix ratio of tall fescue to Kentucky bluegrass is 90-10, when in reality if you do a seed count, you've actually got more Kentucky bluegrass, 52% 52 on a per seed basis versus 48% of tall fescue. So that's kind of misleading. Uh, when you buy that, you think you're getting, hey, I'm getting 90% tall fescue. That's only just a very small amount of Kentucky bluegrass, and it's actually more. And then you can see as you go down, 95.5, 97.5, 2.5, uh, how those break out uh, on a per plant basis, tall fescue to Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, this is also important to know because we've, we've done studies here at NC State where in a matter of three to four years, uh, something like a 90-10 mix can quickly be overrun and become 100% Kentucky bluegrass. Particularly if you're mowing your lawn, your tall fescue lawns, you know, below two inches, uh, and you're favoring the Kentucky bluegrass over the tall fescue, uh, so you can end up with 100% uh, Kentucky bluegrass in a hurry, and not realize it because they look so much alike from a distance. Uh, and then that's where you get caught with this, uh, you know, the dollar spot thing, thinking it's brown patch, and you're treating for the wrong disease. So it helps to identify your host, and I stress this a lot, particularly the landscapers when they take on new cool season clients. To get down on their hands and knees and check out the grass and pull some plants up and look and see just how much bluegrass may accidentally be in there with that, with that tall fescue. So pay attention to that. Conditions that favor dollar spot, low, low night temperatures once they get above 50. So dollar spot actually starts earlier in the year than brown patch. You may see dollar spot start February, March, whereas you don't see brown patch until May or June. Uh, dollar spot tends to shut down once the high temperatures get above 95, which is something we haven't seen this year. So we've actually seen dollar spot all season long this year uh, on multiple hosts. Uh, it takes 10 consecutive hours of leaf wetness. The uh, reason that's important is uh, be diligent with your irrigation management. If you have automatic irrigation systems, water at night. Uh, low nitrogen is a, is a key for a dollar spot, and I'll show you a picture here that illustrates that very well. Mowing too low encourages dollar spot and excessive thatch. So be sure you air file on a regular basis. Uh, but here's a good picture to illustrate the low nitrogen. Uh, so here's a picture of um, a pure stand of Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, and you can see Billy, homeowner on the left, fertilized his yard. And Joe, homeowner on the right, did not. Uh, and you can see right down the property line, the, the dollar spot infection is much more severe. Uh, there's no fungicides been applied here. The only difference is, is fertility. Uh, so with that being said, if you, if you do run into uh, situations with dollar spot, you may be able to drive it out with just a little fertility. You, know, you may be able to put out a quarter pound of in per thousand square feet uh, with or without a fungicide, and you may be able to help clean it up uh, just by using fertilizer. That's all I have. Um, if you'd like to know more about turf diseases or uh, get in touch with us, you can go to our website at turfpathology.org. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. We regularly send out alerts uh, and information as it comes in from our field research program. Uh, there's my email and phone number. Uh, feel free to contact me at any time if you have any problems with your home loans or turf questions in general. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Lee. Um, as before, any questions for Lee? You're going to be able to hang out just a little bit and answer questions in the chat box if people have them, Lee? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we're going to move on then and have Mike Munster talk about some current diseases of interest. All right, good morning, everybody. I don't have Lee's booming baritone voice, so give me a check mark there if you can hear me and understand what I'm saying. All 
All right, looks like a dozen. That's a quorum. So let's get started. Rather than my mug, I thought that this was a lovely flower to show at the beginning of the presentation, a passion flower from out at the Arboretum. I'll show another picture from the Arboretum a little later. That's not quite as pretty. I'm going to talk about some current diseases here, but also let me uh, say that a lot of these are diseases that we'll be looking at uh, in the next couple of months as well. So at the same time I'm talking about current diseases, I'm actually talking about things to watch out for in the near future. I want to start out with a little mystery photo here. Give a thought to what this might be. At the end of the presentation, I'll say what it is. A hint is that the bar on the lower right is one millimeter, so this is not a lunar landing shot. This is something much smaller. All right, we're at that time of year where gardens are kind of getting tired, trees are kind of getting tired. These oak leaves suffer the scars of a long spring and summer. And you can see it's interesting on these, besides the insect injury, we don't worry about insects, right? But besides the insect injury, we see evidence of three diseases on these leaves. There's still some old oak leaf blister here, these two kind of uh, blistered shaped spots on the one leaf. The smaller dots here on the middle leaf are actually where rust infections occurred back in the spring, probably fusiform rust coming off of the loblolly pines in the area, and the very small telia formed on the underside of the leaf, but it left these necrotic spots also. And then the third thing we see are the scorching of the edges of the leaves, often with a sort of a greenish red, if that's a real color, border to them. And this turns out to be our friend bacterial leaf scorch. Let me do a quick flashback to see what's happened over the few months that we've been absent. This was a picture I showed, plant specimen pathogens in June, of a red bud here near the clinic. And that same tree is now sporting a larger number of these spots caused by the fungus Passolora cercidicola. Passolora cercospora are both members of a group of fungi that often cause leaf spots on different kinds of plants. And it was interesting, this same tree was, no, I'm sorry, it was the neighbor tree to it was a very interesting situation. Earlier this month, I walked by it and saw that there was some of the leaves kind of drying up. And like you, my first thought was, oh, it's probably Botrysferia canker killing some of the branches. But then I thought, well, wait, this isn't really the right season for it. And the leaves that are dying are scattered around the branches and on different branches. So that doesn't really match the pattern. Because if it were a canker disease, it would, let's say, kill the stem at a certain point let's say right here, for example, and then everything from that point forward would die. But here we see the leaves interspersed, and even at the end of the branch, some good, healthy leaves. So what's going on? Well, it turns out that this is also bacterial leaf scorch. Fairly typical symptoms of marginal necrosis, drying of the leaves with uh, wavy and uh, wavy border with a different color to it. Oh, in this case, it was a yellowish, or what we call a chlorotic halo. And we tested this tree, and sure enough, it came back positive for Xylella fastidiosa, the cause of bacterial leaf scorch. And this is a really interesting aspect of it. Like happens with certain other vascular pathogens, we see that the leaves on one side of the branch were affected in some cases, but not the leaves on the opposite side. So this tells us that there's something going wrong with the plumbing of the tree in the xylem or the phloem. In this case, it is the xylem. The pathogen is called xylella fastidiosa. It's systemic in the tree. This tree will hopefully be left in the ground for teaching purposes over the next few months and years. And it will every year come out with the disease, although symptoms don't show up until the midsummer. So in the beginning of the year, we expect things to look normal. We assume that it's transmitted by a leaf hopper, as are the other um, the xylella, fastidiosa, and other hosts. And there is really no control for this particular disease. We often see it in oaks 
and in sycamore. There are other strains that occur in citrus, in oleander, and of course the Pierce's disease in grape. Here's one that you're more likely to see. I think uh, everyone who grows big leaf hydrangea will see it this time of year. This is a leaf spot. Does anybody know what it's caused by? Anybody want to venture a guess in the chat box? All right. Well, it turns out that this is a cercospora, so a relative of the disease that I showed there on the red bud foliage. And very common this time of year. I would not recommend any control measures other than keeping the leaves cleaned up at the end of the year. It's a cosmetic problem and probably not worth the time and effort and money for fungicide applications. This, however, is one that can go so far as to warrant fungicides, and I'll mention that in a little bit. I actually didn't bring this one back to the lab to absolutely confirm it, but it serves as an example. Even if it's not this, it looks an awful lot like it, of what we call leaf spot of iris. Now, the fungus has had 10 different names over the years. Four of them are Davidiella, Mycosphorella, Didymelina, Heterosporium. But if we just call it leaf spot of iris, we're good. It not only occurs on the leaves, but also the flower stalks. And this will overwinter in the plant debris. So we'll see why that's important in cleaning up at the end of the year. It's multi-cyclic, which means once the disease gets started in the spring, there'll be infections. And those infections will produce spores, which will produce new infections, which will produce no spores, and so on through the year. Those spores get from leaf to leaf and plant to plant, either by wind currents or by water splash. So if you want to manage this disease, be sure and remove the old leaves in the, either the fall, the winter, or the early spring, but sometime before the new leaves start growing. When you're dividing your irises, make sure to remove all infected leaves that you see, both dead and living. And leaves that come out with spots during the season can be removed or those portions that are spotted. Try and keep the leaves as dry as possible by planting your irises in a nice sunny site with good air circulation, good weed control, not a lot of shrubbery around so that the leaves dry off quickly after they get wet from rain or irrigation and hopefully we're watering at the base of the plants and not getting the leaves wet unnecessarily. There is difference, uh, There are differences in the susceptibility of the cultivars of iris, so look for that as well. And if none of this works, and you're getting unacceptable levels of damage, then fungicides can be used, but they've got to be started in the spring as the new leaves are emerging. Some of the things that can be used are products with chlorothalonil or products with mancozeb, such as daconil. There are a lot of different brand names for those two protectant fungicides. Now you know all about protectants from what Lee told you, and they have to be on the leaf before the fungus gets there in order to work. The spray schedule is going to vary from 7 to 14 days, maybe even a little longer with something that's got some, uh, some systemic action like a microbutanil. Another leaf spot disease that's very common is this one on birch. And this one turned out to be a fungus as well called Cryptocline betularum. It is the most common of our leaf spotting funguses, fungi on birch trees. And this also overwinters in fallen leaves. Other than keeping those leaves raked up at the end of the year, there is really no control that's needed. Again, this is a cosmetic problem. But if you get asked about what it is, you can show off by saying, why, I believe that must be Cryptocline betularum. Going to a picture or two here that were sent into the clinic. This came from Charlotte. It was a, uh, at the courthouse lawn in Pender County from earlier this month. And this one, of course, is a fungal fruiting body, fairly large, coming up out of the ground at the base of this oak tree. Turned out to be diagnosable from the photo as Latiporus cincinnatus commonly known as the chicken of the woods, not to be confused with the hen of the woods, which is a different fungus. And some of the other latiporous species will also cause wood decay, but they usually grow on the trunk or at the base of the tree, not 
out in the soil. Now, of course, it's coming out of a root here, which it is decaying, but it's producing this rosette of fungal material apparently on the soil surface. So that's one of the clues. Also, the white underneath side of it is our clue that this is Lady Porus cincinnatus and not one of its other relatives. It is found on living hardwood trees, especially on oaks, and it does cause a root and a butt rot in the wood. It's difficult, if not impossible, to really evaluate how much damage is going on internally to that tree, and I'll mention that in another slide as well. Charlotte did follow up on that diagnosis with a question, and here's the quote. Here's a question you can address next week in plant pests and pathogens. Are all funds either grow directly out of tree trunks and roots indicative of decay? I will tune in next Tuesday to find out. All right, Charlotte, yeah, I'm are you here. still there? All right. Well, I racked my brain a little bit, and the answer that I came up with is, in almost every case, yes. It's showing that there is some kind of decay going on in that trunk. And the few exceptions would be things like if you got a slime mold, a fuligoseptic or something growing up on the trunk, or a few of the very small, almost um, hard to notice fungi that are just surface colonizers of bark. But in most cases, if you see an appreciable fungal fruiting body coming out of a trunk or out of a visible root, then yes, there is decay going on there. Now, when you talk about things that are in the soil, coming up out of the soil near the tree, it gets a little bit trickier to say. But if you can tell it's coming out of the trunk or the root, then yes, there's going to be decay. But how much, you really don't know, because that column of decay could be there for, for a while. The tree that's in this picture here is still standing, and I walk under that limb twice a day, every day coming to and from the clinic here. And it hasn't fallen on my head yet, but I'm always a little bit nervous when I go there. So that's been two years, and now the carpenter ants are working it. So I'm figuring that eventually that's going to come down in the storm, and the grounds people are aware of it. Here's another one that we had come in. It was just the fruiting body brought in in this case. And we've talked about this on plants, pests, and pathogens before. Not a flying saucer, but the fungus formerly known as Inanotus dryadeus, now known as pseudo Inanotus dryadeus, or the weeping polypore, because it will get water droplets on it in the morning and when, when it's fresh. Fairly lumpy and large near the base of the tree, on especially oak trees, again, hardwoods, and causing the root and butt rot. It's fairly characteristic. So if you see something like this, then you're pretty sure that you're dealing with this particular fungus. The problem is that it doesn't always produce that fruiting body, and eventually those dry up and become hard to recognize. And in this case, it can be a very damaging fungus in rotting away the support at the base of the tree and the buttress roots and so on. So you can get wind throw if you've got enough decay going on here. And it may happen suddenly without warning because the crown of the tree looks good. The water conducting capacity isn't affected. Now, if you notice here at the very bottom of this cutaway of the fungus, there is what is called the tube layer. It's a stack of thousands and thousands of very small tubes in which the spores of the fungus are formed, and they drop out of the openings in the tubes and blow away on the wind to hopefully find a wound on a tree somewhere to infect. And if we were to look at the bottom surface of this, instead of the cutaway at the side, we would see what our mystery photo was. So this is actually what's called the poor surface, poor surface, excuse me, of the fungus pseudoinonotus dryadeus. Our be on the lookout list for September and October would include many of the things that you just saw, but also of course Phytophthora. We had a very wet start to the summer, and now things are drying off, so the plants are going to be stressed because their roots aren't what they were, and we'll start seeing symptoms even though the infections occurred a while back. Powdery mildew will still be in, uh, in our gardens. Root knot nematodes, you may still see some damage from those, and that's just a reminder to always look at the roots. And we'll start seeing nuisance fungi in our mulches, the artillery fungus and certain mushrooms, and in this case here on the photo on the left, our bird's nest fungi. In woody ornamentals, we'll start seeing the fruiting bodies of our malaria popping up. Picture on the right there, Passilora needle blight. 
on things like Grayland cypress, pictured here. Notice the difference between this and ceridium canker. The ceridium canker, it dies from this point outward. Here, the inner needles are being killed by the fungus, and the outer tips are staying green. In our flower beds, once we start getting pansies and violas out there, especially if people go out too early with them and they get heat stress, we'll see problems with black root rot and, of course, many late season leaf spots on other things in the garden. Just a reminder to check those transplants. If you didn't go to Charlotte's workshop and you're planting your vegetables from purchased transplants, to check those carefully. The last, or maybe not the last thing you want, but one of the last things you want is to introduce something like black rot on your cabbage transplants or black root rot on your pansies and violas. Our last watch for item is just a reminder that two years ago in October, the whole box blight situation exploded on us. And please be aware of the possibility of box blight, the typical chocolate brown leaf spots with a distinct margin, but often slightly different color, and then turning a little bit tanner as it ages. So this is the leaf symptom. Visible on both sides of the leaf, by the way. The stem symptoms are these dark streaks, and of course, the loss of many of the leaves that have become infected, especially on the lower part of the plant. If you see anything like this and are suspicious of box blight, please do send us a sample. Again, our useful websites, the plant pathology portal here. The second has to do with uh, more links to boxwood blight information, pictures of the disease, pictures of lookalikes to the disease. I highly recommend checking those out as we head into the late fall. And of course, our clinic webpage where you can keep up on our blog and other information that we put out. Question I see is the host for box blight. The host for box blight are very few. Basically, it is boxwood. And you can see on the website there with the box blight links, you can see the relative susceptibility of different species and cultivars of boxwood. boxwood. There's also something called sarcocoma or sweet box, which isn't used much here, which is susceptible. And as it turns out, pachysandra, which is in the same family, is also susceptible. But those are the only known hosts. Okay, doke. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, I think we're probably ready for the next section. So Mike's not really going to go away. Matt Bertone's going to join him. And we are going to hear about a special feature that I'm really excited and intrigued by called Critter or Not. All right, so yep, this is uh, Mike again here with Matt on my right as you face your computer screen. Hello. And we're going to try a little exercise here. So. In a series of images that we will present, your job is going to be to decide if it's a critter or not a critter that's causing the damage or producing the phenomenon. If you think that it is, then you're going to give us a green check. If you think that it is something else, a disease, a fungus, an abiotic problem, man-made something, then you're going to give us a red X. Please keep track of your score as you go along, because we'll be asking how you did at the end. You'll be self-graded, kind of like golf, I guess. And if there are a group of people there, if you've got a group of a dozen master gardeners or so, elect a secretary. You have 10 seconds to elect a secretary who will take the vote of the group for each image and mark down on the interface which you choose. So ready or not, let's be our first. OK, this, uh, this first one is a hosta from a nursery. So uh, what does everybody think? Yeah, I think the damage is fairly obvious. Look at those answers rolling in. We've got a lot of check marks. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. The mic 
like? What is this? All right, it turns out this is not a critter. It looks like a little bit like insect feeding there, but this wet decay of the foliage that eventually became tattered turned out to be a disease, Phytophthora aerial blight on pasta. So let's, uh, we're not going to publish the results here of the poll. We're just going to have you keep track and we'll look at it at the end. All right, Matt, what's our next picture? All right, these are pear trees that came in from a nursery and they were having this problem on the existing pears in the orchard with these, this, um, how can I say it without giving it away? This phenomenon happening on the leaves, so <laughs> critter or not? All right, that's time and ah, this uh, this fooled a lot of people, and uh, it is uh, with good reason. Those uh, black lesions look like a typical disease, but this is actually caused by the pear leaf blister mite, which is an aerophyid mite shown there. It's a very elongate little mite, uh, very tiny, uh, and they create raised blisters that are first uh, off-color green, and later on they become necrotic and start to turn black. Uh, so uh, this is specific to pears and a couple of other uh, rosaceous uh, plants um, and uh, obviously can be very uh, quickly misidentified. All right, we're going to alternate here so that we don't give away the answer by who is speaking. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, this is a black gum, Nyssa, uh, Nyssa sylvatica. And uh, you can obviously see what the damage is here and what's going on. Um, so what do you think, a critter or not? All right, Matt, I think we're going to do like the microwave popcorn instructions here, and if there become more than a few seconds between the yeah. answers, we're going, to, we're going to close it. But they're still coming in. They're still popping here. All right, that looks like, okay. that looks like a wrap. So what do we got? All right, so this is another critter. This is another aerophyid mite. So you're kind of catching a little theme here. Uh, aerophyid mites, is, this one's going to look fairly similar to the pear aerophyid mite. Uh, they're going to cause this leaf curling on the edge of the leaves and basically the mites will sit in these little galls um, on the black gum. So there you go. It looks just like a disease, might be a disease, but it, it's a mite. Was that a pawn? No, ah, yeah, yeah, I know that. I didn't even intend that. <laughs> Right, this one was actually sent in uh, somewhere down toward the coast. I don't remember now off the top of my head what county this was. This is on a windowsill on a home. Critter or not? Give me about five more seconds here to get your answers in. All right, so it turns out this is not a critter. It looked like to the looked to the photographer like it might have been a caterpillar, but actually this is the 
fruiting, or the sporangia, these little things are called, of the slime mold steminitis. So technically it's not a critter. Slime molds are neither fungi nor, nor animals. They're a group all to their own. But this, uh, this would be an exception to that thing about if you see a fungus on a piece of wood. So this is not causing any kind of decay here. This lived as an inconspicuous thin film called a plasmodium for most of its existence. And then when it was time to produce spores, it oozed up onto this windowsill and changed over into these beautiful fruiting bodies, which produce spores. This, like other uh, slime molds, is not dangerous. It's not uh, going to cause any harm except possibly some allergies. Some people are allergic to the spores. All right, whose turn is it to talk about? I think this is my turn. Okay. Okay, so here we have some acorns from a willow oak um, that look a little strange. Uh, they are not the typical acorns. They uh, look like something weird is happening here. So uh, what is this? Is this uh, insects or critters or not? All right, it looks like we've got a lot of uh, answers, and uh, the majority of people are correct. This is actually a set of critters, but the major critter here inside each of these seeds, you know, in, a, in, a, in an acorn there's only supposed to be kind of these regular form seeds, but a hip ball wasp actually injected its eggs into the acorn when it was forming, and uh, it results in these large seeds that contain the wasp larvae. Now, incidentally, there were some gall midge larvae in there as well, but they probably weren't causing the major issue. And one of the interesting things about this case is that the acorns were weeping uh, sticky substance before this occurred. And that's actually an adaptation where when the acorn is growing, the wasps cause the acorns to weep, and that attracts other wasps and other predators that are coming for a quick drink. And that keeps other parasitoids from parasitizing these wasps in the acorns. So it's a kind of interesting strategy and a very curious case. And until I actually cracked open some of these seeds, I was kind of unaware of exactly what was going on. But you can see the nice big fat wasp larva, the cynipid gall wasp at the bottom. All right. These, these came from an ornamental cherry tree at a home. And I will give this away. The dark, or the darkest areas you see on the leaves are holes. So what you're seeing is the uh, velvet cloth showing through the leaves. Critter or not? All right, we're going to accelerate the pace a little because we are running a little behind here. But I see that the majority are in tune. This is not a critter. This is, in fact, the phenomenon called shot hole. To see how the dead spot on the leaf breaks away. It's actually a host response of the plant trying to wall off the infection, form an incision layer, and then the spot drops out, leaving the shot hole there. In this particular case, there can be different causes of shot hole. It's very common on prunus. In this particular case, it was a fungus with the wonderful name Passolora circumcisa. Okay, moving on. Um, so a gardener found these structures in their garden, apparently cleaned them up, and the next day there were more. Um, that's all I'm going to give you, and uh, let's see what you think, critter or not.
five, four, three, two, one. Okay. All right. Turned out this is not a critter at all. You could drop these things or throw them on the ground and they would bounce a little bit. Not quite like a little super ball, but they were bouncy. There is no apparent organism inside them, so it's not an egg of any kind. Fairly uniform on the interior, although it does have a little bit of a rind to it. And what I am, well, what I told the person who brought them in was that these are what are called water beads or water pearls or water crystal beads, and they're used in floral arrangements. They come in different colors, hold stems in place, and uh, are used for weddings and this sort of thing. So it's still a mystery of why these were accumulating in this one particular spot of the woman's garden, but it was not eggs being laid by some nocturnal animal. All right, the introduction to this is it's a bald cypress and some golden yellow patches on the needles and some needle curling going on. Critter or not? I think I think these people are catching on to us here, man. I, yeah, I think yeah. they've got some kind of clues, ex, extra extra clues. All right, well, we didn't fool you there. Okay, this is another area fired mite on bald cypress, and you can see if you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't look closer, you would just see this rust. You might think it's a fungus, but that little white waxy thing, ice cream cone kind of thing, is the mite. Um, and you can see it on the previous picture, but uh, here's it magnified. And this is uh, caused by the swamp cypress rust mite on bald cypress. And this was collected on campus. Okay. Uh, and this, this is the last one. This is uh, Euonymus. And you can obviously see the, uh, what's going on here. So what do you think, critter or not? Come look at the stems and the leaves. Yes, stems and leaves. All right, people are getting a little reluctant to uh, to chime in here, Matt. Do you think we've scared them? I don't know. Well, this this one was kind of uh, I won't say mean, but this one I can understand why there's so many. Oh no, it's the other way around. They're getting it right. <laughs> yeah, this is just this is not you on the scale. These dead areas, these raised bumps, are in fact just edema, where the plant, it's a physiological response. The plant is trying to push up more water from the roots and it can transpire. And some of the cells get inflated, filled with water. They eventually die and you may get a corky sort of a spot like you get on geranium or in this case, these little dead raised blister-like almost that can, be, that can be popped off actually the surface. So good job. Now, tally up your how you did on this A to E scale, and uh, where E is, is good, of course, uh, and we're going to go ahead and change the polling to the A to E multiple choice. Or get me to it there. Thank you, EJ. So let us know how you or your group did. I guess being tricky is the point, huh? <laughs> I want to mention on the euonymus, when I, that sample first came in, that I glanced at it very quickly and thought it might be scales, but I had to go out of the clinic for a few minutes, and so I didn't get a chance to really look at it. 
And then when I came back, I talked to Mike about it, and he said, oh, yeah, it's just edema. I was like, huh, that's interesting. So if you basically scrape it open, you'll see whether there's a little uh, soft bug underneath or just tissue, plant tissue. And it's amazing how, how clean that plant tissue is underneath that spot. All right. Now the moment of truth here. Trying to publish the responses. And, well, um, of those who did the exercise and recorded their score, we see that the most common ones were getting five to six of them, a little bit more than half correct. And a couple of folks had seven or eight correct. So we realized this was a little bit of a of a challenge, but we wanted to, to do that, make it interesting, and show you that there are things that can can fool us, especially at first glance. Now we'd like to also work in a feature next week, I'm sorry, next uh, session in two months now. And in this case, we're going to talk about some urban, could be rural, legends. And we might do some myth busting, or we might do some actually uh, myth confirming. But we would like your input on it. So anything that you have related to insects, plant diseases, or fungi that is folklore, or common knowledge, or gossip about town, please send it to us, and we will address it next time. All right. Thanks very much for a uh, new fun exercise. Um, next, uh, Matt will continue um, with his portion of the program talking about some current insects of interest. Okay, thanks, Barbara. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? I'll assume since we've got some time, we need to move on that yes, people can. Okay, so the big thing, one of the big things you're going to notice right now are the fall webworms. Uh, they they are um, out and about right now, mainly on uh, on many different trees. So this is a type of tiger moth. Uh, so people can't hear me apparently. Um, should be okay. Um, Maybe turn up your uh, speakers or things like that. Okay, great. Okay, so this is a type of tiger moth, Hyphantria cunea, uh, and they're often noticed during this late summer, early fall, thus the name fall webworms. Now, this insect is considered to be one of the most prolific of all insects, feeding on over 600 species of plants worldwide. Uh, here, around here, we're going to have it eating things like hickory, mulberry, oak, pecan, sourwood, persimmon, poplar. Redbud, sweet gum, willow, and many more. Here's uh, here is one that was found on Centennial Campus. A young group of them uh, that were eating some redbud, and you can see they've enclosed the tips of the branch with um, uh, webbing. And the young larvae begin to skeletonize the leaves, whereas older larvae, as we'll see in a second. Uh, down here is kind of the damage that the older larvae will produce, where they start to eat almost of the entire leaf, leaving just the veins left. Uh, here's an unfortunate tree that is covered almost entirely in webbing. So smaller trees are going to be more affected by these. Uh, and you can see in the middle of the web, especially the original web, you're going to find a lot of dead leaves, and you're going to find shed skins. Uh, feces, the frass of them, uh, and kind of a big mess. So what do these look like? Um, so here, the, there are actually two forms of, uh, of fall webworms. Uh, the ones I took, I took these out near Lake Johnson in Wake County uh, on Sunday. Uh, these are the red-headed form. You can't see here, but it's got a reddish head ye and yellowish-orange spots and a gray background. Uh, there's another form that has a black head and black spots, but both have in common these extremely long CD, uh, very long, and the the caterpillars are about uh, an inch long, three quarters of an inch to an inch long. It's not huge, but not very small. Uh, adults are going to be also variable in the color, and they've actually commented on northern and southern uh, races, basically, or or types. And uh, the white ones are going to be found more 
and the north and these ones with the black spots and then you get a little bit more color when you come down south. Uh, but it's not exactly that way and we could probably have both forms here in North Carolina. Uh, so as far as control, uh, what you want to do is destroy the webs uh, and uh, Reach uh, and you can do this by reaching with pr and or you can uh, destroy the uh, or prune the branches to have these webs and this will expose the caterpillars to predators and parasitoids things like that. Uh, higher ten higher tents up in the uh, tops of the canopies can be destroyed with a pole trimmer uh, and if you're going to spray uh, spray the foliage that's outside of the web. Uh, if you try and spray the caterpillars while they're in the web, it's not going to reach them and be effective. So you want to spray the foliage that they're going to start eating when they come out of the web. Uh, the other thing is that unless it's a small tree or a sapling, uh, it's not going to really severely damage the tree, especially since these are late summer, early fall. The trees have done a lot of their growing. The leaves aren't as, as necessary as in the early spring when they first come out. So these are going to be basically um, more cosmetic, especially the larger trees. Uh, just a note, these are sometimes too or confused. Uh, I was even confused by them for a long time. So tank caterpillars are going to be, Malacosoma, are going to be coming out in the spring or early summer and their tents are going to be created in the crotches of trees and branches, not at the tips. They're also much larger as larvae and more colorful, much darker too. And the adults are brown with white stripes and fairly compact. Fall webworms, however, again, are going to be coming out late summer, early fall. The tents are going to be the tips of the branches. And the adults are white with, this, with the larvae like I described. Um, so uh, before we move on, are there any questions about fall webworms? OK, well, uh, I'll try and answer them later if, if so, but it, until then, I'm going to move on. Um, OK, so another thing is we've, uh, Dave has talk, talked about, Dave Stephens talked about lace bugs before, but I just want to mention two lace bugs that I've been seeing recently. Uh, some species have been submitted to the clinic or photos. Uh, so these are both going to be in the genus Koithuka, which has about 50 species in North America. Now most of them are going to be on plants that we're not concerned with. They're going to be just on wild plants, things like that. But some are going to be pests of plants that we enjoy. Um, so like most uh, lace bugs, these are going to be leaving large fecal spots under the leaves and living under the leaves. And their feeding will cause stippling and sometimes if enough feeding has occurred, it will cause uh, more chlorosis and cell death in the leaves. And if the trees are stressed or the plants are stressed, it can even cause plant death. Uh, one of the interesting things about lace bugs is some of them have maternal care. So the mothers will uh, sit over top of young nymphs and they all feed together and she will actually try to chase off uh, predators and parasitoids, things like that. So they are kind of interesting, pretty um, bugs, but they're not very interesting when they're eating all your plants. OK, so here's a picture of a nymph, uh, very different than the adult. They don't have this big head, uh, the helmet. Um, they're going to be flattened and spiny. Uh, and you'll see that this is actually on sycamore, and that introduces our first one, the sycamore lace bug, Coithuca ciliata. Uh, this is the only lace bug found on sycamores. So that's basically a diagnostic character. If you find a lace bug on sycamore, it's going to be this one. However, it is also known to attack ash, hickory, and mulberry, but again, more commonly on sycamore. And this one that was brought in from campus, the large sycamore leaves actually had a lot of chlorosis happening right outside, right outside the main veins, uh, and it looked very brown and rusty. Uh, it, ha it is native to North America, and actually in the reverse of what we usually think of, it has become a pest outside of North America, especially in Europe. I was first detected in Italy, and they use a lot of sycamore for shade trees, so it's become a nuisance and a pest in Europe. Okay, then the next um, lace bug we're seeing is the chrysanthemum lace bug, Coithuca marmorata. Uh, these were taken from what I think is Solidago, so uh, the uh, goldenrod, but these appear on many composites or asters, including Solidago, Aster, Ambrosia, Helianthus, Rudbeckia, and Echinops. 
these are told these are a little bit different, of course, by the host, but also they have much more brown coloration and a much bigger helmet. If we go back to the uh, the other one, you can see the helmet is a lot shorter in the sycamore lace bug and it has less brown on it. Okay, uh, moving on from lace bugs, let's talk about some other bugs. Uh, I do love this group of bugs, and I'm going to basically talk about plant hoppers versus leaf hoppers because there's a lot of bugs we're going to be seeing out in the gardens, and I want people to understand which ones are generally good and which ones are generally not as good. So one of the, the group, this group is called Akinarinka, my hardest one of the hardest words to spell in entomology. Um, but you don't really have to know that. Just know that it includes this group that many are familiar to us. So they're going to be similar to aphids and psyllids, but are a distinct group and much larger usually. Um, and uh, they're going to include one group includes the cicadas, leaf hoppers, tree hoppers, and frog hoppers. And then the other group is just called plant hoppers. Unfortunately, they don't have many common names, even though they're very diverse. Um, now, all of these, all of these groups will almost all feed on plants. They're all going to be sucking insects, sucking this, this sap out of plants. Uh, though a few of the plant hoppers actually feed on fungus. Um, now some are pests, but that's mainly in this group of insects. And I'll, I'll refresh you on which of those are before I start talking about some plant hoppers. Now plant hoppers are rarely ever pests, and that's kind of why I want to make this distinction. So when you see these, you don't think that they're infesting your plants, that they're going to cause diseases, things like that. OK. So the first, these are not plant hoppers. Now these are the fairly obvious ones. I hope people know what these are. Uh, so cicadas are one. This is actually one from the Dominican Republic. But of course, cicadas are fairly familiar to people, so they, a lot of them look similar around the world. These are very large sucking insects. Uh, they live in the root, on the roots of trees when they're young and they emerge. Um, then you have tree hoppers, which most often have this thorn-like shape or actually have these crazy horns, things like that. And that's how you identify tree hoppers, is because they have this large kind of helmet over their back. Uh, now these groups, these non-plant hoppers, um, will have these very thin uh, antennae that are in front of the eyes. So that's really the major, one of the major ways to distinguish these. So again, cicadas are in this group. We've got tree hoppers. Uh, as Gina mentioned, uh, we have a group called frog hoppers or spittle bugs. Uh, here are the three main groups. Uh, if you don't, if you've never seen a two-line spittle bug, I would be extremely surprised because they are very common. This is a group. This is a species that feeds on grass as larvae or as uh, young nymphs. Uh, and then you've got these spittle bugs. This is a class Dipterid. Uh, but we're calling them all Cercopidae right now because that's kind of the catch-all name, uh, although some of these have been broken up into different families. And then here's an Aphrophora. These are very large spittle bugs. Uh, now these differ from leaf hoppers in that they have a crown of spines around the back, the hind leg, the tip of the hind leg, right before the tarsus. And they won't have spines along the leg. Uh, they're going to have just basically a crown of spines. And of course, the nymphs are very easy to see because they live in this spittle mass uh, that Gina showed us nicely. Um, and uh, there are actually some things, some organisms. There's actually a type of fruit fly or vinegar fly that parasitizes these, that comes in there and lives in it uh, to get in protection, and a couple other ones. And some exotic species actually make tubes out of calcium. So they make these really crazy tubes. So these are frog hoppers and spittle bugs, again, a common uh, in gardens. And then we get to the largest group uh, within, within the non-plant hoppers. And these are the leaf hoppers, the cicadelidae. There are over 20,000 species of leaf hoppers in the world. Uh, so one of the largest uh, families of insects known. Uh, very diverse, very colorful, range in size from a couple millimeters to uh, um, over about half an inch. And uh, the defining characteristics shown here by the arrow are the many long spines along the hind legs. So you can see that on this one. Um, does anybody happen to know what this species is? Uh, 
Okay. Well, um, maybe somebody's typing it in, but this is actually the glassy wing sharpshooter, which is the nemesis, the uh, trend, the vector of xylella, which we, uh, which Mike was talking about before. Uh, this has become a pest, especially on grapes in California. Uh, it is native, but I uh, don't think it, or it's uh, not native to California, and so it's done a lot of damage there. Um, but you can see the leaf hopper shape. They're generally um, kind of small, and if you can tell, it's very tough to tell. Again, their antennae are going to be in front of their eyes, and this is going to distinguish again this whole group from plant hoppers. Uh, one of the interesting things here on this glass ceiling sharpshooter is that some leaf hoppers uh, create these waxy coatings, uh, which they extrude from their their rear and put up on their wings. And these are made up of very microscopic particles called brocosomes. And what they'll do is once they lay eggs then, they will kick these brocosomes over top of the eggs to hide them. They hide their smell. They may protect them. Nobody really knows their exact function, uh, but they, they do this. And so if you ever see a, a leafhopper with these white patches, that's what they are. Of course, gray facephala right here are very common in gardens, very bright colored uh, pink and orange and green. Uh, very common leaf hoppers. So again, all of these are not plant hoppers. And some of these groups are going to be detrimental to your plants. So what are plant hoppers then? Okay, one of my first and favorite plant hoppers, although it's not as crazy looking as some of the ones I'll show, uh, is the family Acanalineidae. Again, these plant hoppers are all just called plant hoppers or Acanalineid plant hoppers. None of these families really have any common names which is kind of difficult when you're discussing them, but uh, we're going to try and use the scientific names. So here you can see in plant hoppers, their antenna is below their eye. It's not in front and, and uh, hair-like, as in uh, leaf hoppers, tree hoppers, cicadas, and frog hoppers. These are very good mimics of leaves. You can see here's, here's this one isolated on a white background, but on its natural, in the natural setting, it's going to look a lot like a leaf. Um, Acanalineid leaf hop or plant hoppers are going to be characterized by their reticulate wing venation. The entire wing has kind of these reticulate veins and no rhyme or reason behind them. Uh, and they're very similar to another common group uh, right here, the flatted plant hoppers. Um, so flatted plant hoppers look very similar, except they're going to have a number of longitude or, or parallel veins going around the edge of their wing. And also, on this part of their wing, they're going to have granules. They're going to have little bumps, almost warts all over it. So that's how you can tell the two families, flatteds from the acanalineids. Uh, this one right here in particular is a very interesting one. It's uh, named Metcalfa. That's the genus. And uh, that was actually named after the former department head of our entomology department here at NC State University, Z.P. Metcalf, who was a very famous uh, researcher on this group of insects, these, all these uh, plant hoppers and leaf hoppers and such, mostly plant hoppers. Uh, very pretty little specimen, nice orange eyes, but both of these groups, uh, these and the acanalineids are very common uh, in gardens. OK, moving on to some other plant hoppers. Uh, here are a number of different families of plant hoppers that you can find around. Um, though a couple of these, these two were taken in Dominican Republic. They look almost exactly like the ones we have here. So succeeds normally have kind of spots, black spots along their, the wing veins. They have these big bulging eyes and these little crests. They're a very common family. Uh, Achillids are very easy to identify because they have an overlapping wing. All others are going to have wings that go straight down and no overlap. These are one of the groups that do feed on fungus as, as young, so you'll find them under logs, things like that, but they'll come to light. Uh, Delphacids are one of the only groups that may have some pests, especially of grasses and especially in marshes, uh, but most of them are not pests. And you can see the antenna here clearly uh, that shows this group of plant hoppers, um, and or all plant hoppers, how they basically have a very thick antenna 
with then a little hair coming off of it basically. And so again, you can have the antenna under the eye and have it very thick and with a little hair instead of mostly like a hair. Uh, you can identify delphacids because they have this very large spur on their hind leg. It almost looks like a big heel. Uh, then commonly in yards you'll find isids, which are kind of alien looking, uh, maybe not so much more than the others, but uh, very strange looking, kind of mottled. And again, these are very difficult to identify sometimes by um, the uh, layperson. And then lastly, one of my favorites, Sedusa, this derbid, uh, very pretty blue with red eyes. I often see them on my dogwoods and on leaves around my garden. This is uh, derbids are also another group that, as young, they live, they feed on fungus, and sometimes the adults will take sap from plants. But again, not a lot. These are not going to be damaging your plants. Lastly, um, a couple of really interesting plant hoppers. Uh, so these are native. These are local. Uh, I, I found these uh, right in uh, right around uh, Wake County. Uh, first are piglet bugs. This is an immature. It's just got wing pads. Uh, but this is in the family Calicellidae uh, that used to be in the family Isidae. Again, you can see there's a very thick antenna that's under the eye, and it's going to have a little hair coming off of it. And they sometimes, sometimes call them Jimmy Durante bugs or um, beetle bugs because they are very commonly mistaken for beetles, or they look like they have this very giant nose. Very interesting, very cute little group called piglet bugs. Then you have this derbid here uh, in the same family as that blue sedusa we saw, except this one looks like a dragon almost. And these things are only about uh, seven millimeters long or so. The piglet bugs are fairly small, about four or five millimeters long. Um, but when you magnify them, they look really beautiful. This one looks like a dragon. And that's basically the top of the head, and the mouth parts are going to come off down here. So if you see this crazy dragon-looking bug, don't freak out. It's not going to burn your house down. This is, uh, this is just a plant hopper uh, that's gone kind of crazy. And then in the tropics, we have the last group. We have Fulgoridae. Um, the, actually, the whole entire group of plant hoppers is called Fulgoroidea or Fulgoromorpha based on these big lantern bugs. So if you go online and search peanut-headed bug or lantern bug, you get some other ones. But these are very large bugs, uh, very crazy head ornamentation. Uh, and uh, they're going to feed on plants, but they look, again, they look very uh, aggressive, crazy looking. But in gen they, but for the, they will never hurt you. They do not hurt the plants, really. They are not aggressive. It's more to ward off predators uh, to look like that. And again, here you can note the antenna, which is large and bulbous. and has a little hair coming off of it, and it's below the eyes. Um, and to wrap up our plant hopper section, I wanted to talk about uh, just a couple of things you might find in your gardens, too, and that is baby plant hoppers. Uh, so these are some of the really some of the cutest insects, I think. Um, most of these plant hoppers are going to produce wax, wax filaments, either a wax coating over them, or they're going to produce these filaments. So right here, remember that big green leaf-looking acanalinid? Well, this is a baby acanalinid, and these are very common in gardens. You have this crazy spiral, uh, you know, hallucinogenic eyes, and these crazy wax filaments produced at the end. Now, flatids will often be found on plants, especially herbaceous plants, uh, sitting very flat and extruding all these wax filaments around them. And so they're kind of camouflaged. They kind of just look like maybe a fungus or something growing on there. But if you look at them, uh, this one I kind of poked to see it go. So you see it flattened on the plant, and then it starts to move, and then you can see that it's a little plant hopper. So this is going to turn into that other group of leaf-like uh, plant hoppers, the flatids. Okay, um, that was uh, kind of a lot of a lot of pictures, a lot of craziness, but uh, hopefully you kind of get the idea of what plant hoppers are, what plant hoppers are not. Uh, again, look for the antennae below the eyes, and uh, kind of just uh, imagine what you've seen in this presentation compared to the leaf hoppers, the cicadas, and tree hoppers. Um, are there any questions before I move on? Okay. I'm sorry. I had a quick question. 
Sure. Back to the um, lace bugs. This is Charlotte Glenn in Pender County. Mm -hmm. We have a terrible problem with antenna lace bug here at the coast and have had for several years. And I was okay. just curious how far inland you are getting reports of those. Um, I have not seen, had any submitted of any lantana lace bugs yet. Um, so I'm not sure if it's a regional thing or not. Um, we do have plenty of uh, lantana growing around here. Um, but um, I'm not sure. I, at least I haven't had any complaints about it. But most lace bugs are going to be treated a similar way. You're going to want to, uh, you can find the, the chemicals and the insecticides online, but basically you want to treat them early on in the, in the spring when the nymphs are young and spray the bottoms of the leaves, basically. That's, that's, going, to be, uh, that's going to be what you're going to be looking for. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, Okay. Uh, oh, is that economic impact uh, for plant hoppers? Um, if that's if that's the case, uh, they, there really isn't any economic impact. They're going to be randomly sucking the plant juices. They're not going to be introducing any uh, pathogens. Um, they're basically kind of just hanging out, and they're so random and so um, singular when they're on on plants, they're not really going to be doing any in, impact. Uh, the things will feed on them, and there are parasitic wasps, uh, I didn't include a picture, that will catch them and lay their eggs inside them. Uh, but that's just because they're nice food. But anyway, they're really nice to look at. They're really cute. So just observe them in your gardens. Uh, don't don't try and kill them or anything, because they're, they're really kind of nice little fauna. OK, um, moving on. Something interesting. We've been getting. We got a couple photos of these, and I found these in our yard. And most people, when they find them, they think they're aliens, or they think uh, you know there's some kind of toxic waste dump nearby. But land pl land flatworms, planarians. So these are flatworms in the phylum Platyhelminthes, and the land flatworms are in the Geoplanidae, um, and uh, these all need moisture to survive and are very sensitive to drying. So you're going to find them when it's wet. Now this year has been particularly wet. I found a number of them under a recycling bin in my yard. Um, so they're going to be under uh, moist in moist situations. All are predators. Uh, they all feed on soft-bodied uh, organisms, especially earthworms, but also snails, slugs, insects, and other so small soft-bodied organisms that they can get the, wrapped around. Uh, these can grow to be several inches long, and some, like these bipallium, are very colorful, uh, orange or brown and black striped. And many of the species that we have, especially all of these hammerhead worms, are going to be invasive. Uh, we have about five species in the U.S. that have all come from uh, potted plants from outside of the country, mostly Southeast Asia and uh, some other areas of the world. Um, so they are not necessarily that great for our fauna because they're going to be eating earthworms specifically. And what they do is they wrap around them and they exude a digestive sticky substance. And their mouth is actually on the bottom of their body midway down. And they basically just suck the worms dry and just suck the, basically the digested fluids. And there's some pictures online of them attacking earthworms and what they do. Um, but just another picture, so we've got the hammerhead worms, Bipallium, this species is Coenzi. Uh, again, this is going to be the common one around North Carolina. But I also, when I first moved them into my house, found another land flatworm that didn't have a hammerhead uh, under a rock. And this is probably, this again, the funny thing is it's a flatworm with no common name because not many people study them. And this is probably Myco Microplana terrestris, uh, which I it's either native or um, from Europe. I wasn't. I couldn't get a clear answer from the literature, uh, but it's not. It's going to be eating small organisms, but it's probably not as uh, as invasive if it is at all uh, as the hammerhead worm. So again, be on the lookout in your gardens if you see this giant worm with a hammerhead. Again, it's not going to try and eat you. It's not going to infest you. It's not going to be eating your plants, but it may be eating some of the soft-bodied organisms in your garden. OK, so moving on. Anybody want to tell me what these two things have in common? Do they eat mealybugs? Do they eat mealybugs? 
Well, this is something a little more specific, maybe in common. Okay, this segues into my next section. Both of these are ladybug larvae. Uh, this one may look like an actual mealybug, but it is actually a ladybug larva, and both of these are in the same group. And so what I want to talk about today is on my beneficial spotlight, some atypical ladybugs. So basically kind of uh, destroying the, the notion that all ladybugs are going to be shiny red with black spots. Uh, so ladybugs do vary in color, and they vary in size from 1 millimeter to 10 millimeters long. Uh, ways to identify ladybugs is generally that they're going to have three apparent segments in their feet. Uh, they have short clubbed antennae, and they're going to be generally rounded uh, in the overhead view. Um, now this one is one I found in Oklahoma, but it exists here. This is called the ashy gray ladybug. Really pretty one, but of course not. Uh, red. This also comes in a form where it's all black with two red spots. Uh, so these can vary too. Uh, but again, not red with black spots, but grayish with black spots. Um, another one that uh, that I found recently. Uh, this is actually the larva right here that I showed before eating some aphids. This is the Diomis ladybug. Uh, this is a member of the group Skimnine, which are the very small dusky ladybugs. Most of them are under three millimeters long. Most of them are going to be black or brown or some other dull color. A lot of them are fuzzy, like this one. Um, and this group, this, these ones in particular feed on aphids, but some will feed on other types of sucking insects. Uh, so we got actually a couple of images from clients about uh, these larvae on plants, whether they are good or bad, they're obviously going to be good because they're going to eat aphids. Uh, so again, no red, no red, no black spots. Here's one that's the opposite. Um, I like to mention this one. This is called the twice stabbed ladybug. Uh, instead of red with black spots, it is black with red spots. Um, and these have been found to really love armored scales. So they prefer armored scales over soft scales and prefer soft scales over mealybugs. Uh, so here is a, these are false oleander uh, scales on oleander. And basically you can see the destruction that these twice stabbed ladybugs caused uh, to these scales. They basically chew them open and eat the soft bodied insect underneath. So again, if you see this, this is, is a ladybug, but you can see it's rounded. You, you can count the three tarsal uh, segments and such, and know that it's a ladybug. Uh, and lastly, one of the more interesting ones that we have around here um, is the Vidalia beetle, uh, which is red with black spots, but it's very fuzzy and it kind of has not just distinct spots, but kind of this crazy uh, patterning of black on it. Now, this is a really interesting beetle we learn about in entomology, specifically because it presents a case of classic biological control. So the cottony cushion scale was introduced into California uh, over 100 years ago, and uh, it basically devastated crops. Now, um, C.B. Riley sent a guy to Australia to find out what eats the cottony cushion scale, and he came back with this little ladybug called the, was named the Vidalia beetle. It was actually in the genus Vidalia until they found out that, that genus was used for something else, and now it's Rodalia, Rodalia cardinalis. Now these are specific to cottony cushion scales, uh, and they basically destroy them. So this was actually found right outside of our building in uh, Raleigh, and uh, they are all around the U.S. now, even though they were introduced into California at first. So wherever cottony cushion scales are found, you're going to find these Vidalia beetles. Um, they are, in fact, ladybugs, and again, you can count the, the feet and these little short antennae and know that it's a ladybug. Um, and just as a final caveat, there are many beetles that are red or orange with black spots that are not ladybugs. So here, for example, is a Chrysomella beetle in the family Chrysomelidae. Uh, these are going to be pests. They are going to be feeding on plants, um, and so you can count the feet, you can count the number of segments of the feet, also see these antennae are fairly long, a couple of the shape is not right, but again, not everything that's red with black spots is going to be a ladybug. Um, are there any questions before we move on to the last segment?
Okay. Well, with the last couple minutes, uh, let's move on. So, things to look out for. Now, again, Gina uh, started to mention these, and so I was uh, I was happy. We're going to get a reiteration, basically, of these. So, oakworms are out and about. Um, they're probably a lot of them are starting to crawl off the trees, but we still have some young ones up in the trees, uh, and these are all going to feed on oaks mostly red oak types, but uh, Dave Stefan actually found some of these pink striped oak worms on some white oak. This is actually white oak leaf, uh, which is actually kind of strange for them. Uh, but we have things like the pink striped oak worm, Anisota virginiensis, and this orange striped oak worm in quotes because there's two very closely related species that may even be the same species, Anisota senatoria or Anisota stegleri. Um, but this is the most common one I've been getting calls about and people talking about is the orange striped oak worm. Uh, and they're very large caterpillars, very noticeable. Um, and they're going to be up in the oak trees. Luckily, they come later in the season, like around now. So they're not going to be doing a whole lot of damage or death to trees unless they're very young. Um, but they are very noticeable. They leave a lot of frass everywhere, very large pieces of frass everywhere. And uh, they they're kind of an annoyance to some people when they're walking around in their driveways, uh, things like that. Um, now the adults uh, look like this. This is the pink striped oak worm that were reared off uh, by Dave Stefan. Uh, this is the female right here and the male right here. The male has these little windows in the front wings. The female does not. Uh, so they're fairly robust moths. These are both about uh, an inch and a quarter long. Uh, so just just uh, you know small for a Saturnid, which is the group that they're in. You know they're smaller than Luna moths and smaller than some of the other ones, but not a very small moth generally. Okay, um, and there's some good information on control of them. You're going to want to get them early in the sp early in the season when they're small caterpillars. The only problem is they usually go up high in the trees. So you're going to need a pole sprayer or something like that. Um, and you can look at the, you can view the chemicals online that would uh, help control them. Lastly, a couple other things. Uh, the annual cicadas, Tibisen, are coming out now. Um, these are the big green dog day cicadas, they call them. Uh, they're going to be the loud insects out there right now. Uh, I was brought a nymph uh, that was crawling around, and once I gave it a place to climb up, it actually emerged. And I took a nice sequence. Some of the people that see our Facebook page might have uh, seen this already. But uh, here's a sequence of what happens. They basically break out, uh, start to pull out. And they're going to pull their uh, breathing tubes. Are gonna, all the linings of that is going to come out. That's the, there's going to be filaments coming out. And then they come out and start to expand their wings and then rest on the shell and basically expand their wings more until you have a nice dried cicada. Uh, that's ready to fly off and uh, mate and then lay more eggs and whose nymphs will then drop to the ground and suck on the roots of trees. And with these cicadas are going to come these cicada killers, these big uh, hunting wasps that specifically prey and paralyze cicadas. Uh, these wasps are very menacing, big looking wasps, but they're generally not at all aggressive. Um, and unless you were to grab one, you will not get stung by them. And you can sit by and watch this really interesting habit of them catching gigantic cicadas and stinging them and bringing them down into their underground burrows. Uh, so again, with the cicadas come the cicada killers. Uh, but you know, it's a very nice spectacle to see these giant wasps doing their work. And with that, I am uh, done. Any questions? Any questions for Matt? All right. Uh, some announcements from Lucy. Um, reminding you to stay in touch. Have an email list uh, for Master Gardeners, the website, intranet, and the association. Sorry, I can't embellish on these. <laughs> Um, and I uh, wanted to uh, announce or remind you that there's a couple new portals. This is a new web portal for therapeutic bleh, horticulture. Um, and there's a, um, also a master gardener and extension 
uh, gardener portal. I think that slide got um, lost um, sometime previously. So, but there is a a uh, extension gardener portal. I'm sure if you go into the extension website, you'll be able to find that. Um, and as you can see here, Lucy is giving you all kinds of links for um, uh, all of those different portals and websites. Um, I imagine that um, anybody who's attending that International Extension Master Gardener Conference has already uh, made their arrangements. That's coming up quickly. Um, a Natural Learning Initiative Design Workshop is coming up uh, in Chapel Hill towards the uh, early October. And um, then the Master Gardeners uh, Association State Board meeting is coming up also in uh, early October, October 8th. Um, some further date outdates you can see there. I won't read all of those off. Um, you're probably aware of them, but there they are. And I think that um, pretty much covers that. Um, I'll put in the plug for plants, pests, and pathogens. The next section will be on the 22nd of October. So I think that's all we have for you today. Thanks to all the speakers for excellent presentations and for staying on time. Very important. And um, I think we're ready to say goodbye for this session. Barbara? Yes? I did want to answer a question that was typed in. And Debbie Green is now signed off. But maybe uh, somebody who's on still will tell her. But the answer is yes, the native Pakistandra, the Allegheny Spurge, is susceptible, has been shown experimentally susceptible to the box blight pathogen. Where it's been found in the landscape, like in Connecticut, that was on Japanese spurge, but the native one is also susceptible. OK, thanks, Mike. Any other quick questions and answers out there before we let you go to lunch? All right, thanks for everybody for participating, and thanks to our speakers.